Hello and welcome to our guest lecture today. Um, we have with us uh, Dr. Vishnu Zogaikar and Dr. Madan uh, sir with us here today. Um, everybody knows Dr. Vishnu Zogaikar, so I'd like to request uh, Vishnu sir to give a brief introduction to um, Dr. Madan sir here and we will start the session soon. Um, so please feel free to ask any questions during the session and we look forward to your response. Uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Madan Thangavelu. Uh, we met some 10 years back uh, during development of a high impact project about Shat Kriya Kal. And uh, Dr. Madan, I knew at that time, was a molecular biologist. Uh, I searched him on Google and I found that he has uh, analyzed saplings of uh, various apple trees situated at uh, many physics institutes, supposed to be uh, progeny of the Newton's apple tree. So he analyzed, took samples from all those uh, trees, analyzed them for DNA, and found out that many were fake, <laughs> and very few were genuine. So that kind of curiosity marks Madan sir. So he, I got to know him later, uh, in Majdev, he was born and brought up in a situation where he was totally immersed in Ayurveda. His father was Dean of Government Ayurveda College, Trivandrum. So uh, he was brought up in that environment. And then he studied First, veterinary science, then did his PhD in molecular biology, went to Cambridge as a fellow, and he's working there since then. And our interactions are uh, all over the field, uh, we can say. Means we discuss about uh, mathematical theory of Tridosha. We uh, discuss about uh, micro RNAs in uh, Rushti Kshir. There is no limit to our discussions, and uh, many good things come out of that. And uh, I'm more eager to learn from him hear from him. So I will stop my introduction and hand over the mic to Nazan. Namaskar. Vishnuji, Namaskar. Ji. Now you want to put this on my and tell me where to stand. Wherever you are. Where you can capture me everywhere. Thank you. Vishnuji, thank you very much. Sachin Deshpande Ji, Namaskar. And uh, Girish Ji will join us at some point, I think. So, Vishnuji has correctly said our interactions have it's been a while. And Vishnuji was coordinating a Vaidya scientist program, which are there are all the people here, Girishji, Sachinji. We took, they had uh, Professor Ashok Vaidya in Mumbai had written a small proposal and he wanted to bring, just like a physician scientist in America, they wanted to make Vaidya scientists. So that program got started. Vishnuji was put in charge and he said I should be a mentor in this program. And over the program, we were interacting with all these students. Every day there would be five, six emails and there'll be long messages. A lot of things were discussed. And I was learning from them. And they felt they were learning from me, but we were learning from each other. So it's a very interesting kind of situation. 
where when I started, they were all talking in the language they understand. And they were saying Samhitas and Adhyaya and Tikas. And I didn't know any of these words. I knew Samhitas, but the rest of it, I didn't know how many Tikas there are for Charaka Samhita. And they were talking about all these. So I learned. When I hear a word again a second time, and I say, I should find out. Then we, so that is the process. So I, when I said we have to have a dialogue and keep this dialogue going, that's the idea. You learn a lot from this dialogue. Now, this is a presentation I made recently in Wagoli. There was a big cancer conference, the sixth Ayurveda for cancer conference in Wagoli. And everybody in Ayurveda knows about the family there, Sadrish family, and the work they're doing there. And I was saying to many people before coming to Pune that this is a second time Pune in Ayurveda is on the world map, leading the rest of the world. Number one, Pune is the world capital for Ayurveda education. It has, at any one time, this city has more Ayurveda students. I think the number is more, four and a half thousand students here. Just students, undergraduates plus postgraduates. So this is the world capital for Ayurveda education. So that was the first map, pin on the map. The second one, this is the only city in the world where we have a dedicated conference for Ayurveda. And it is the sixth conference. And I said I would talk about not Ayurveda biology, which we hear from many places, but I thought we will talk about Ayush biology. Now, if you minimize the screen and show me the list of slides you see on PPT, I'll just show you what I have as a stack. Give me that other option, display the, okay. There are 61 slides here, but if you see, go all the way to the bottom of this the stack, and I just want to show you why I am using this word, Ayush biology. And it is on that second last slide. You know. Can you see this one? If I'm on my way, on the way, then please. So this is why I have used the word, um, Ayush biology. Yes, so we are saying the human body can be understood using many languages, many systems of understanding. And shown in the middle is what modern biology understands. Modern, and that is a very young area. In that much of this understanding about the anatomical structure, although it has been known for a long time, but those fine classifications, nerves and where they go in the body, all this is less than, I don't know, maybe 500, 600 years. But on the two sides, on the left and the right side, are representations of the human body well beyond this. And my desire to use the word Irish biology is based on these kind of representations of the human body. That you can understand the human body in so many different ways. And shown on the left-hand side is that a very interesting, the Shad Chakra kind of concept. And from there you have the different links that come out and some, it's, it's a, it sounds mystical, it sounds poetic, it doesn't sound like science, but it is a science. And the same on the right hand side, another representation. And I feel there is biology in this representation. And that is understood by many people. And hence my word, Ayush biology. So I want to distinguish it. I want to bring a all inclusive biology. And starting, I want to take this journey, starting with the cells and starting with small aspects of the human body and see if we can connect with this and see if we can understand where future biology needs to be. So I'm going to, we, we'll flick between one or two. Others. So if we go back to that display of slides, then I, I will cut out all the introductory stuff because then we'll have a little more time to discuss. So actually we can go in reverse, you know. So let's start from the, let's start from the last slide and keep going upwards. So that's the last slide, you see? 
is a very is something written in Latin which says, measure what you can measure. Because not everything might be measurable. We don't have the tools and techniques. And I use this. So it says, measure what is measurable and render measurable in time. Just leave things. Time is not right. With time, you will be able to measure this, what is not right. And the, the reason why I say this is next year, Vishnuji mentioned about the DNA and DNA fingerprinting and all these things. Next year is the 70th anniversary of the structure of the double helix of DNA in Cambridge. It's only 70 years old. But in 70 years' time, it has percolated every area of biology. How is it possible? In 70 years, it has touched every area of biology. And how can we have a science that is the next slide? We're going up, we're going from up. Oh, right. Let me see if I can make a talk from. So I've showed this image. How can we have this science for thousands of years? And people don't get it. It is not going beyond our country. DNA came from that small town of Cambridge. It has only, even today, it has, I don't know, 250,000 people only. And it has taken a message to the whole world. So what is the reason? Let's move, continue on. And the complex representation of the human body is as shown in this image here. Dennis Nobel is on the right, on the right hand side here. It says this is a, it's a complex system. The complex system, I don't know how well we have understood it. And his last statement is very correct. There are many more rules to be discovered. A genuine theory of biology does not yet exist. So everybody is in the same boat. If you can explain your science well, then people might start to come to you. There is no, and the reasons why he's saying, he says, you see, DNA is not the sole transmitter of inheritance. He's making that statement based on some understanding. And we are saying, yes, Punarjanam, that is also some information. That is also controlling something in us. You are talking, there is, uh, there is no privileged level of causality. You are seeing an effect here. We are saying Panjabhut controls this thing. And then there's Tridor Siddhant that comes in between. And everything is interconnected to everything else. When we come to looking at Saptadhatu, you are saying all the Shukradhatu is everywhere in the body. That means everything is connected to everything else, which to me, it seems that your system of understanding has more completeness. There's more, there's something more complete about it. Because you don't stop with the theory of just the nerves and the bones and all these things. You are connecting it to the outside. You're connecting it to what is, what is there outside. Let me see if this will work. Okay. Now, said so I'm going back. This is Sidney Brenner, and his work was very special. He was he came in the same lab as Watson and Crick. And he was the person who discovered the genetic code. Watson and Crick and the team showed there is a double helix. And this double helix has the properties of complementarity, two base, two pairs, two strands, and they come. But the question remained at that time, that was 1953. The question remained, how do you go from DNA to protein? This is a big puzzle. And he is the man who solved this. And he gave us the genetic code. And he was very clever in how he analyzed. He said, there are only four bases and there are 20 amino acids. How do you make this connection between the four bases and 20 amino acids? And he said, combinatorics. 
you have to take three bases at a time because if you take two bases at a time, you get only 16 combinations. If you take three bases at a time, which is the next step up. So you see how logic was very mathematical. He just goes on to say, take three bases at a time, then you get 64, which is much more than what we need. And he then says, well, that is the only way. It's two is too little. The next step up is three, which gives you 64. And so he then said, this is how the 64 is connected to the code, the 20 amino acids. And he predicted, he said, there'll be redundancy in the code. And then he made it all the logic and note, what we have today is a table, a table with all the A's and G's and C's and T's and how they form the different codons. But the cleverness is how he broke the code. And then he went on to do many other things. And he then finally, as he got older, he's no more now, he's passed on a few years ago. He said, he made a very interesting comment. He says, I've done all these things, but I don't think that uh, we are really understanding biology. That is only part of the story. The DNA is only part of the story. There's much more to be understood. And that is where you people are. You know the story, you know, you understand everything. And you have to now rethink in the context of, bio, of what the biological rules to understand how to fill that canvas. What Dennis Nobel is saying and what Sydney is saying. Now, if Sydney was alive, Sydney didn't know anything about either. But if he was alive, and if we informed him about Ayurveda, his mind would have looked at Panjabut Siddhant, Tridosh Siddhant, Saptadhatu, Kriyakala. And he said, ah, this is what I want. Because this has the logic that we need. And you have even deeper principles, the Darshanas. And they hold even more rules. And he would have said, oh, we need to learn biology. So I have used uh, Sydney's statement, the blue, teaching biologists another language. I have taken that and I've said, not only teaching biologists, but also doctors another language. Let me see what's in the next, okay, the next slide, set of slides is about this. This is Ritucharya. Now, Ritucharya is a, such an ancient concept. Ritucharya, Dinacharya, a very ancient concept. And we don't, we are taught about it. How are we interpreting it in the context of, bio, of modern biology? Okay, so, if you look in here, I hope this pointer worked. Okay, there we are. So, the paper is titled Widespread Seasonal Gene Expression Reveals Differences in Human immunity and physiology. Now this is exactly what Shankriyakala, uh, sorry, uh, uh, Rituchariya is telling you. That you have Rituus and your Rituus are connected to a calendar which is based on the phases of the moon. And that is very clear. And we have six Rituus. You could have divided your calendar into any number of parts, but they decided six ritu. And because it, that six ritu has an impact on the body and it affects your physiology. They felt it and they divided the calendar. And they said, this is, these are the ritus. And the cleverness is when they say how your doshas are imbalanced with different ritus. Even cleverer than that is what are the treatments you have to do? What are the uh, preventive measures you have? To do? Now, how did they know this? So this was thousands of years old. How did they know this? I don't know. So we now move, so Charaka Samhita talks about all this. We, that is thousands of years old. We now jump to where we are, 2015. And we, let us look at this uh, set of slides here. And the abstract, this is from Cambridge. John Todd is an immunologist interested in type 1 diabetes. 
And this study is part of a PhD, uh, but this is a PhD student, Mexican PhD student, a veterinarian who came and wanted to study with John. And they looked at a simple question. If you take all the genes that we know today, and they didn't take all of it, they took only 44,000, which is about one sixth of the total, approximately one sixth the total number of genes. And they made a system for scoring of the chip. And they took RNA from the blood, the nucleated, mononucleated blood cells, prepare the RNA at different months, shown here are the 12 months, and then estimate the expression of the genes and see if the expression varies, changes. And you standardize, there's a simple technique in and you see if these expressions change. And they found some genes are there, which there is no change. There are some genes like this that has very low expression in the winter. This is in the Northern hemisphere. This is almost the, the peak, January, February's peak winter. And then as the seasons change, it, it, genes increase. And then they took a subset of genes, and these are genes connected with the immune system. And what did they find? That the expression of some of those genes drop in the winter, makes your body more susceptible. Problem. And they asked some other questions, whether these are, um, that's like moving. Sorry. Okay, here we are. And they can, they can look at the genes that are up and down regulated. And they find there are these genes here, which are genes involved in keeping the timing of exp timing within your body. They call the clock genes. Approximately, they're genes that control the rhythm in the body. And nine of the 16 genes are destabilized. They are not only, it is not only happening in uh, the uh, blood cells, but it's also happening in other parts of the body, the adipose tissue. Now, my mind at that point says, how will we connect this with Ayurveda? So I've already made the connection here with Ritucharya. But am I able to connect it with something else, with some other dhatu? Can I drill it down even more to some of the dhatus? And it seems like that's what we see. We see something in the metadata. Yes? Now, at that point, only you as Ayurveda people can tell me what more you can see in this data. What more will you see? There is something you will see, which you will do as a standard procedure. What would you do in the winter months to, that somewhere affects metadata, either directly or indirectly? So I'm just putting a question there. This might be, a, might be an incorrect question. It might be an ill-posed question. But this data leaves you here. It's, it says we see an expression of the genes, and those expression changes vary with the seasons. And the tissue we started with was the blood cells, because John is an immunologist. He wants to study the immune cells, so nucleated blood cells. But then the student said, why don't we check at another tissue also? And they look at adipose tissue. They don't know anything about Ritucharya. They don't know about uh, uh, Ritusandis. They don't know about where your doshas are in different seasons. How can we help them? Can we guide the research? I think you have an opportunity to guide the research in that next space. There's a gap there. They are stuck. They don't know anything else. They don't even know what is Ayurveda. 
but we are seeing, we are saying, oh, this is only Ritucharya. This is, we see it. Well, what is it that you want? So there's, a, there's an opportunity here. Here is another example. This is the uh, daughter of the former prime minister of, you would have heard the story many times. Now here's another example where she lost her eyesight for many years and she went around the world. Then somebody said, go to India. There is a place called Sridharyam. And for many generations, for 500 years, they've been working on Netra Chikits. And he went there, she went there, and she met this Vaidya here, Vaidya Nambudri. And she got her sight back. Isn't that amazing? So here is a person who lost to have a eyesight and then gets it back. It's like magic. So there are lessons that you have. There are things routinely. For him, this was nothing new. He said, ah, I've got to do a treatment here. I don't know what is the logic. I'm hoping to have an interview with this guy. Just to find out how, what is his logic. He saw this person. And what did he see? What did he see in her that made him suggest this chikitsa. So I'm deconstructing that situation. And this is very important for us because in his logic, it is not a problem. In every American institution where she went, they said, we don't know how to solve this. You, know, it will just, you will just lose your sight and that's it. There's no treatment for it. And he can treat. And for him, it was not a, just a routine treatment. How did he understand this? Open question. And I hope we can talk to him and find out somewhere how, how he managed. Now, we have Sachin Ji here who's doing, of course, he's a very senior physician, right here, and surgeon. And, but he is doing his PhD on uh, Sridhar Siddhan and aspects of Sridhar Siddhan. Now, I'm curious if Nambudriji will be able to, of course, everything has to revolve around the Sridhar How does he see this problem? And how can we reinterpret this whole thing? Now, the next small set of slides here is to do with um, cancer. I'm going to run this in reverse, okay? And I'm starting with this section here, with this, little bit here, put a blue box here. And this blue box is a transition from normal to pathology. Routinely, we now have DNA tests, which fall beyond this red line. There must already be a tumor somewhere. And then we see blood markers, and we can see sometimes even cancer DNA comes in the blood. We call it liquid biopsy. You know, you can, there's a lot of DNA in your blood, and you can look for mutations that are known, and you can detect. There is a small company in the States called Cellmax Life. They're based in California. And they are saying, from this red line, we are going to push it further to here. We are going from a normal epithelium to abnormal epithelium. And they are pushing, putting a, this is their line, this mark. And they say, we can catch it even before. And I'm telling them, we have a science that will take you even before that. And they are very curious to know. So we have, our discussions are going on. And that logic will help you see this transition from normal to abnormal. It is not quite disease, but it's normal to abnormal. So in the previous slides, we said we can detect this in the body. We have the seasons, we have the ritus, and we can confirm that with change in gene expression. The body is still normal, 
the seasons are changing and the genes. And that logic is part of our understanding of the human body. And we, within your science is also what I'm pointing at as the early stage. I'm calling this this stage. You see this up here? And I'm saying, yes, my confidence, I don't know how to do this, but I'm confident enough to say that in your signs are the lakshana for these transitions. And I think most of you will straight away say, oh my God, I know where these lakshanas. What is the purva root for this? Wouldn't that be amazing? I'm banking on you Ayurveda people to guide us here. The man in America, he says, really, you can do this? And I said, yes, without knowing all the fine details. But I'm confident that you will, you will be able to do this. This is very major. It's a major problem in Western Europe, all of this. And the beautiful thing here is this, that we have between healthy colon to a potential disease is 10 to 20 years. You can do so much in this space. And your science knows all this because you have divided the human life already into three phases. Number one, yes. And you're saying as we come towards the third part of this, Vat is going to increase. You know all the Lakshanas of Vat Prako. So you are, you've made a hierarchy here of understanding, biology. And you're saying after about the 30th year, you must do something. So Ayurveda and much of the Vedic sciences says that the human life is designed for 120 years. The first 100 years is in your hands. The last 20 years is God's gift. So we don't, how should these will not work there? It is last 20 years if you live. So we have taken that span and we've divided it. And we know exactly when you see new lectures coming up. I don't need an X-ray. I don't need an ECG, but your, your theory says that this is when, this is the kapha phase, this is the pitta phase, this is the vata phase. Now from there, we can drill it down, we can step back. So you can use some biology tools, like, I don't know, some of those gene expression patterns. You can interface Kriyakal with Saptadhatu theory. And it, I think it, we don't need to do it. It might be in some commentary somewhere. It might already be, I don't know, maybe it's in Charaka Samhita. If you read the lines, you will understand it there in Charaka Samhita. But it might not be explained directly to you. You might have to search and make correlations. There. You might have to do a little bit of homework to understand. But I feel it is there. The logic is so clear. And it, that is something our task is to reinterpret the, what is in the text and to take examples like this. This is, this is all modern biology. This, was not, this is not known before about all these polyps and all these genes. And all, these are all genes as we progress, sequence of mutations. They may not be completely correct, but at least this is an approximate scheme. The same with the understanding of Kriyakala. But your Kriyakala logic is so clear. If you have to have 
if you have to create something up to the bed of Asta, you have to go through these different stages. Otherwise, it will be a localized disease. It will not spread. It cannot. And the first three steps of Kriya Kala, anybody can manage. And there are the things that are happening when the Ritu changes, or as you get older, they're all reversible. So there is some superior knowledge that you have. Okay, now I want to spend a little time on these two slides here. And I want to take you into one example of one karma. And this is, you know which karma I'm going to talk about. So uh, I'm doing my talk in reverse now. <laughs> so for those who saw it there, I was doing it the other way around. Now I'm going back in reverse. And it still makes sense. I'm surprised it makes sense. <laughs> so in reverse, we come to Nasya Karma. And Nasya Karma in the context of COVID. And here in the, Lata, the Mangeshkar Hospital, your chief physician there, I keep forgetting his name. What's the chief physician? Haji. So um, he's had many, and the COVID was going on, he had many documentaries he put out about Jasya and Jalneti, you know. And he was saying, you know, I do this, and this is all you have to do, and I still see patients, and I'm still here, and my team are doing this. But we, we couldn't understand the connection there. Yes, we are saying this is a karma in Ayurveda, Jalneti comes from yoga, and then we can, you know, it works. But the, on one hand, when we know so much about DNA, and we know about how to understand bacteria and all these things, so many different types. And on the other hand, somebody says, oh, just do wash your mouth. But just, it's difficult. Secondly, they don't know how to do the Nathi. And but his document, his video on YouTube, you'll see, is very clear. He says, that's what you have to do here. This is what I do. There's a base in here, and I just do this, and it works. But that is that enough to convince people? For us, it is easy because we have seen our grandfathers, grandmothers do this. We don't even think about it. And we have got so many other Nathis too. We have Sutra Nathi, and we have seen all these things. So for us left to us if we want to do it or not. But this study was very important because this study talks about immune cells that are sitting here on, on the back of the floor. And I want to point to one or two things, threads I want to bring in here. Number one, this study comes from Italy, from Perugia. And they've done a very clever analysis. They've looked at the bacteria in here. So there is a lot, there is a lot of bacteria here. And they've done something even more clever. They're trying to connect this bacterial diversity with susceptibility to COVID. Now, that is very clever. That's a good link they're making. And the link we are making is sitting on this side and the two sides of this. And we are saying, oh, by the way, we have a procedure of Neti and Nasya and we do all these things, but we stop there. We don't know how to take it forward and make it look palatable to people. While here, he, they go on, they characterize, and they say, we have looked at the bacteria in this part of people, and we find people with COVID-19 have some problem. There. They don't stop there. They go on to do the analysis. And this is what they find. They find the, okay, that the bacteria there, are unbalanced in a completely different way. This virus is going on in this part. And they went on to look at the, you can do metagenomic analysis You can take all the, you don't need to isolate bacteria, you take all the bacterial DNA and you can sequence it and you can look at all the pathways, the genes that are there and pathways and you can find out what is the balance in the total biochemistry of this community and the total biochemistry of the other community. 
and you get me at an idea. And what do they find here is very interesting. They find that there is a destabilization in this tryptophan pathway. And tryptophan is important for making these very important things. You've heard of all this serotonin, melatonin. These are all things that control the, the, the physiology of the human body in brief. And if the, the flux of this reaction, if it goes in the wrong direction because the bacterial community is different, then it starts to go down this branch of the pathway. And it's called the kynurenic acid pathway. And as you come down this pathway, you come to all these compounds here. These are the final compounds, picolinic acid, and these are small organic compounds. These small organic compounds travel through the tissue here, the nasal epithelium. They can go in. They talk to the next layer of cells behind the nasal epithelium, the immune cells. They cause inflammation in this local area. They're pro-inflammatory molecules. And from there, it leads higher up into your pituitary, which is sitting just there on the back of your nose is your pituitary. There is a crosstalk every day between your pituitary and the nasal epithelium. Now, what made the Italians look at it so closely? Perhaps. The highest statistics, the deaths, were in Italy when Italy was the epicenter of COVID at that time. And they were curious to know. And what they discovered indirectly, it's not complete data yet, indirectly, most of the deaths were in the most air polluted parts of the country. So the reasoning here for us is. Air pollution, particles going in, destabilizes the bacteria. Destabilized bacteria lead to destabilized pathway. Destabilized pathway leads to two effects. One, reduction of production of these good things and increased production of these bad things. And before you know, it has destabilized the entire HPA axis, which is central for keeping the whole body together. So you get a double whammy from the environment being the trigger. So you see, when we take that old knowledge of Nasya and Nepi. And you are using Nasya for treatment. By the time you come to your clinical years and you talk to people, Nasya is used routinely for treating ovarian problems, treating bone problems. And you say, what is this nonsense? How is it possible? And indirectly, we can now see how it might be working. Maybe somebody has an inflammation in the nasal epithelium causes a constant imbalance of the HPA axis. And that is the reason for all their complications. And you as a Vaidya comes along, and I don't know how you read the patient, but you read the patient and you say, okay, Nasya for this person. I don't know how you will do it. Sachin, I don't know how you do this. You know, when do you resort to Nasya for treating a problem? which is not directly anywhere here, but elsewhere in the body. So this is part of Kai Chikitsa somewhere, you know. You don't even think about it. You're saying, yes, we just do it and it works. But they don't believe it because they don't see the puzzle. They don't see the pieces, steps in between. But with evidence like this, we can fill those gaps. And with evidence that you have, you can fill gaps they have. There are many gaps in there. They don't understand. They see bacteria. They see destabilization. That's it. They don't know what to do. While you are saying, by the way, we, can, we have 50 different dravyas. 
we have dravyas to match every prakriti type. We have matras. We have, um, how should they say, kalas. We know when to do this. We say, do nasya at this time. You see the amount of specificity. They don't even know you have something called nasya. It's like they are looking in completely different directions to solve the same problem. This side is looking this side. This side is looking elsewhere. They don't know that they are, have the same problem. So, so uh, shall I go through a few more? I can, I'm going to stop very quickly, but I'll go through a few more and take you to one of the first slides I had, which is very important for us. So this is where technology sits now. Somebody has lung cancer. You can actually look at what is being, and that is nucleic acid. This is not organic compounds. You can look at microRNAs. There are small RNA molecules that come out in your breath. And these RNA molecules are master coordinators of different gene activity. They're called microRNAs, you've heard about this. And you can look at all this. You see, these are the kind of markers that you can analyze in your breath. The power of that to be integrated with the power of what you have. It will be so amazing. They will, I feel, they will never understand the depths of the knowledge here, at least for the near future. But for you, it will be easy to understand the others. And you can make some big contributions there. I won't go into this. This is all to do with the cancer pathology and all the stuff. Basically, what we saw earlier. I want to spend uh, just one minute on this slide in terms of uh, Dravyas. And this is a very interesting study. And the study comes from here, Haryana. And it's to do with understanding specificities and how you prepare, how you harvest, how you grow Aushadis. Uh, and so, here is a very important plant. You all know this, Pianospora, Luchi. And there, is, there are variations of this. So in the country, we have different types. You can go to Kerala, there will be some type. You can go to Bengal, there will be some type. And they will all have different, uh, the, 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 the strength of this will be different. So that's one. Number two is a very specific variation, which is, Giloy grown on neem. I don't know where it appears in the Samhitas, but somewhere is mention of neem giloy. And the question is, it sounds like a fairy tale. If somebody tells you, you should only harvest from this tree, and I say, what the hell are you talking about? This herb is growing everywhere, but why are you saying I should only harvest this? It sounds like they're trying to make some big story and they're trying to sell you something and they're trying to take your money or oh, there are so many possibilities, okay? But Neem Giloy is supposed to be very effective. And I don't know if you look at your text, it will tell you where you should use Neem Giloy. Professor Darber grew Giloy on all these trees. They're all trees, medicinally important trees. And then he said, I'll do a fine analysis of these. I look at the standard new, new biology technique. I'll test it out. And what does he find? That some of these chemicals, they are upregulated when it is grown on neem. Isn't that amazing? How does this happen? I don't know what the answer is. My approximate analysis of comment here is that every plant has different bacteria. If you look at fecus, it has some bacteria and fungi microbes associated. If you look at neem, it has something else different from fecus, and so on, so on, so on. But when you grow neem on the top of uh, uh, well, sorry, Guduji on top of neem, 
there is some interaction. And those bacteria that we saw, how the complicated bacterial pathway is here in the nose. It's the same, similar thing is happening here. It just upregulates something. And if you know about bacteria associated with plants, the reason why do bacteria grow on the surface of these plants? All these have different, huge numbers of bacteria. It's because the plant cells are giving them some sugars. There is some sugar that leaks out of the plant cells and the bacteria grow there. Now, there are, it is not only sugar, but there are so many other chemicals in the surface also. And so only some bacteria can grow on plant A, some will grow on plant B. But when you grow a second plant on top of the first plant, this is what you get. And all these are very, very important chemicals in the cancer pathway, in the cancer treatment pathway. And you'll see the number of references for each of these. There's so many people are searching these. If they happen to be using a plant that is not in association with the correct plant, you will never see these chemicals. And they would say, ah, oh, this is all nonsense about Guruji having this stuff. What they forgot is that specificity it had to be named Eloy, only then will you see it. You see the specificity that's needed that we have to respect. So here is another example of where that truth is. Now, um, I'll finish off with this last, maybe one or two other points, but here I want to make a point. It's about to connect how to advance this way. How can we take this forward? Okay, now I've convinced the other side. I hope I have convinced you. If you are on the other side, I hope I could convince you that my knowledge system from starting with the very end, you know, we have imaginary uh, Ida, Pingala, Shushmana, and we have 72,000 Nadis, and we have energy flowing in the body, and we have all these things. And they say, oh, we have had so many fairy tales like this. Okay. And then I go to the next story. And I say, you know, by the way, COVID, we use Guduchi, and it does this, 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 and it works for us. And they say, oh, no, we don't believe it. And then I show them this. And then I say that it's cancer. It takes so many years to progress. And we know how to understand this. We have a theory behind this. This is how we understand. And we have ways to control over uh, progression of a, no, that, no, we don't believe that. And then I say, look at this. We have an example. We have something called neem geloid. And this has to be grown in this plant. If you then do the analysis, you get this. This one? No. I don't have this may nay. I don't know if I uh, uh, there is uh, that is in another stack. So there is, and then Giloy is a strange plant because you have male plant and a female plant. Did you know that? No. Giloy is a dioecious plant. The sexes are different. Not many people know this. So when you make Guduji Sattva, which one do you use? Which one will produce more Sattva? So we don't think about this, but these are very important things. Asha? Asha? 
it will try to go in both directions and then when it hits the soil, amazing. There are very, these are very important principles. Now I've always wondered, why do you use Guruji Sattva? Number one, how do you prepare Guruji Sattva? Number two, why, what is special about Sattva? We, when I look at Guruji Sattva, I say this is only starch. Starch? But I think it has much more in it. We are saying it's starch. Uh, Madam Jobata Reba, Guruji seems a very sensitive plant to gravity. Or the gravitropism is more relaxed. You are saying it grows both directions. Most plants will not do it. They know exactly where to go. They are directed by gravity. So it seems like something in Guruji is independent of that subtle aspect of gravity. Now what I think is if you take Guruji Sattva and you do a fine analysis of some magnetic material in Guruji Sattva, you will find something there or something that is missing, which is there in other plants. Plants respond to gravity. You know, if you put a seed, the seed will always have one bit going down and one bit going. So it's just a suggestion. This is how I would analyze it. Anyway, if I got to this point, and for some reason, the other side says, oh, this is interesting. And the reason will be very clear because they are thinking products and they want to make new products and they want to go to markets. They will have a big marketing system there and they want to understand that. So they will say, oh, this is interesting. Now, so we then would come up to this situation. We would come up, you know, to, come up to an interaction between two countries. This is where we are, between India and the UK. At the prime ministerial level, there is an engagement that's going on. This is available on the web, you can look at it. So this is a 2030 roadmap for India-UK engagement. And within this, you will find many sections here. There are five sections in this. One is climate, and security, and so on, some business. And, and the fifth section is this one. This is section five. And it says, Ayurveda and alternative meds. For some reason, the two governments have said, okay, this is a big breakthrough. They wouldn't want to listen to anything about Ayurveda, but now it is in a policy document for the two countries. And it says here cooperation on research into Ayurveda. So, research into Ayurveda and promote yoga in the UK. So read that document carefully. There are only 13 words here in this. It is very important to understand what they say. So they're saying research into Ayurveda and promote yoga in the UK. And there are reasons for this. So we have to read between the lines. And then there are some other things. There are things happening here, work of, work of mobility there, and shortage of nurses, Nobody wants to come to the UK to work. And so the chief minister of Kerala came there two months ago and he assigned a memorandum of understanding with the health service for sending nurses. So that is a, if you read between the lines in this document, there's Ayurveda on the top, there's health work on the bottom. I think we are very a step closer to sending Ayurveda work. It's just me thinking. They won't tell you what it is. But to see the arrangement of these two things seems to me it's very interesting. But we must continue our interaction with them. We must continue to discuss with them. And we must use these kind of methods to make that interaction. You see, we see opportunity. India right now, for the next year, for the next 12 months, is, the, is holding the presidency of the G20 nations. So we can now easily move this into the G20 discussion. 
And we can say, oh, by the way, we have a document with UK. We want this for the G20 countries. We want Ayurveda research in all the G20 countries. Now, that's a very good thing. If you were Minister of External Affairs, I think you would push for it. Yes, you would say, okay, by the way, you know, we want to put this on our agenda, health for all. And that is what, if you look at the G20 agenda, Vasudeva, Kudumbagam, and all those things are there. It's a good thing. So we have to be swift to read between the lines. So, um, what is the science? There are some things about the science, and I just want to show you here Herbert Froelich. And Herbert Froelich talks about a concept here called the flux tube. Now, the first time I saw this, I said, this is just like a shrotus, a tube. And if you visualize it this way, you can start to get the mathematics of how to work with. You can understand, we might be able to explain why is the Shrotas of certain dimensions, how they are scaled. Shrotamayame hi shariram. Everywhere is shrotas, shrotas, shrotas. Why are these shrotas of certain size and certain dimensions? You might be able to answer. I'm going to finish here, others, because there are, oh, maybe not. There's so much stuff in here. I'll use this, this as the last slide here. And this is, uh, I'm trying to put two concepts here together about understanding progression of this most swift progressing cancer of the pancreas. Most times they say, uh, uh, Sachin will know about this, about by the time you detect pancreatic cancer, most times you survival is about six months. Six months to one year, that's it, it's too late. And I'm trying to see if we can get some inspiration from Ayurveda. And I don't know, you will be able to recognize this shloka here. This is Charkasamita Sharir Sankhya, Sankhya Sharir. And within here, I'm looking at some very important words here. Uh, the one I am particularly interested in is, is this one, Paraman. Now, I do, my Sanskrit is not good enough. I have to, this is a lot of work to come up with this. Thank you, Ji. Lilu? Yes. No. My Sanskrit is not good enough for understanding all this. And you have to, whoever knows the Sanskrit will have to tell how to understand this better. But I see a few very important words. So this is Deha Parmanu. I don't know when you put these two together, I don't know what to make of this. Sachin, I don't know what to make of this. What is the context and how to understand this? The other words here I can understand. Uh, this one, numerous speaker. And it talks about uh, this word is easy to understand because of Atindri. It's easy to understand, and I can give many examples to, to explain this word in terms of modern biology. DNA was a good example. It was mine. So you see, there are many layers of meaning there. And it's a, perhaps a word also for the finer concepts, subtle concepts like Madam here, Prana. I'm very happy to have Madam here. Uh, Professor Okaichik, it's uh, in which college, Madam? In which place? Kahabiji. So, and Madam is especially, she's the Professor of um, uh, Kriya, uh, sorry, uh, Kaichik, it's, uh, but her real passion is understanding prana. Prana. And she says, many of the complications have a beginning at the pranic level, at the level of the prana. It is beyond our indriyas. 
And I have always felt you cannot understand prana. And the reason is very simple because it is like a concept of teeth and biting. But if you put the two concepts together and somebody says, can you bite your teeth? The teeth is a concept. Biting is a concept. But if somebody says, if I, <laughs> it just slips out of our hand. The two words are good. Teeth is good. Biting is good. But biting your teeth is not possible. So I th always thought it was one of those concepts. And through several, for several reasons, Madam says, I can detect your chronic changes. Now, for me, this is very special because I started off with one slide where we talk about colon cancer. And he said, I have a technique based on Shad Kriyakala and concept of the human body over so many ages. I have a concept of earlier and earlier detection, whether it is ritu based changes or where it is Kala-based changes of the human body. But no. Some of it is difficult for a lot of people. You know, if you tell somebody you have to follow Ritukarya and uh, Swastavrit, it's difficult for a lot of people, most people. So they will automatically make mistakes. They will automatically, they will forget that 20 year window when you could have corrected by changing your diet by having, uh, not having, uh, what's it called, the uh, Virudahar aspects. You could have examined all of those aspects, corrected things. You could have checked for markers, Lakshanas that you have, for arm um, Lakshanas. But nobody told them about it, or they were too lazy for it. And they are now in a point where they're feeling a little uncomfortable. What do you do? Uncomfortable? Okay, two days, it's gone. Then it comes back two years later. We are still within that 20 year window. Two years, three days, okay, it's gone. Then two years later, another. Maybe it is coming back in the same Ritu. But I don't know about Ritu. This year, I was reading about what happens when winter approaches? Adanakala and Visarka. It is all described in your text. Where does the Agni go in the body? That it goes for you can monitor all this heat in the body. In the summer months, the body is more warm, it's evenly distributed. As winter comes, for me, for my prakriti, I get very cold. My hands and feet get very cold. And somewhere in this central part, it's all coming into the body. And this last few months, particularly the last three weeks, suddenly the temperature dropped. And I could feel something here in this part of my body. And I'm saying, ah, oh, this is that concept of Agni, you know, it's getting cold, that Agni is coming. I didn't do anything, but it was not comfortable for a little while. Now that, and then I came to travel, everything went fine, and I met Madam. And she said, I do all this stuff. I can teach you how to do the prana, and because we have an interest in prana from, in Italy, we have a small group where we are developing devices to understand prana. So we are, it's a small group where we are trying to understand how to measure prana. What is this thing called prana? What is this chakras and nadis and how to measure these things? And we are using knowledge from different systems, not only Ayurveda, not only yoga, but also Chinese systems. And there's a reason because they understand nadis. 
they understand meridians and you can understand, you can measure these things. And so we have an interest in this area. And then Madam comes. Three days we were in Bagoli. And the third day, as she was getting ready to leave, I said, Madam, can you do one thing? As she was just getting ready to leave. And not because I wanted to test, but something said, ask her to scan your aura. And she said, give me two minutes. And she closed her eyes and she stood here next to me and she read my aura. And she said, I can feel something here. So we have, so I'm just saying, so since then we, yesterday we went to DVP, but DVP, Madam was there. And I said, today you must come here because we will meet a lot of young people and senior people. And we want to be in that gathering and see if somebody has a vasana for these. You know, different people have vasanas for this. I had a vasana for DNA. Since 15, 16, I, I was completely crazy about DNA. I, that's where I want to go. I want to go to the university in the same lab where Watson and Crick works. Nothing else will do. So, and I'm still there 41 years later. So we don't know who has what vasana. And that vasana comes as a part of some punarjana aspects. We don't know. They say if you want to be a good Jyotish, you must be born a Jyotish for seven generations. Because there's so much knowledge to learn. So these are subtle sciences. To make the subtle growth, we need something. Either time, a lot of time, or an environment, or time plus environment. Like we saw with Tinospora, Neem Giloy. If you grow Giloy anywhere else, it doesn't have some quality. That quality might be measurable, but that quality might also have to be understood differently. We don't know. But your science is very special because your science has the beginning in something called a react. It takes you that far. It takes you all the way to avyak. It says, this is avyak. From avyak, you have to make come into the world of yes? And in that process, you will have the gunas coming out, the maha gunas will come out there. And then as you progress further, you will see how you get solidification of these maha gunas into the panjabut. And then there is another set of interactions going on. And then all of a sudden you get life. And within that, you will see the three doshas in operation. And that image I'm showing here is to explain, to ask if all of you can see the, if you can see within here the Panjabut. So we have moved from Panjabut as you understand to Panjabut, how we might have to understand at the level of these Deha Paramanus. Can you see the Panjabut here? Can you see why Akash? Can you see Vayu there? Can you see Agni there? Can you see the two others? And can you see the three doshas in operation? but it's there, it has just gone down to another level. Avyakt, Nirguna, Vyakt. You didn't get the human form just like that from Avyakt. It evolved 
through millions, billions of years, had to make life. There are also three doshas worth. There's also Panjabhuti. And then you come up, come up, come up, you come to the human form, which is how you are seeing. And you learn Kriya Sharir and Rasana Sharir and all those. But today's demands require you to understand pathology at the level of cells, at the beginning of pathology. Can you see Kriya Kala in this? Where does it go wrong? So our task is to look what Girishji challenged me with today. He sent a note saying, Ayurveda through the prism of biology, modern biology. I am saying, you can see straight away, there, is, there can never be another way. Tridosh Siddhant has to operate at this level also. Panjabu is what that is. It is just a way of reimagining what we have. I will leave it here. And we would, I think we will have time for a few questions because if I take this, keep talking, then I might get late for something else. These are all things there. I just want to start with this. This is, this is the bit that I just wanted to show you. You can read the Sanskrit. I cannot read the Sanskrit. But I don't know how you are interpreting that. Um, I pointed out this bit here. Especially this bit here. Karma Swabhava. What is this thing? Can you explain? You cannot, you know, if I try to explain word by word. I don't know, I'm not, I'm not, I don't have a yes or no for it. I just have to learn from you. I said I want to learn from you. When I started, <laughs> when I started, I said I want to learn from you. So this is a, so I finish here. Thank you for having me. And thank you for listening to me. Thank you. I, I, I want, please continue because I want to see you.